All right, so today's lecture is on cardiorespiratory endurance. This is a measure of fitness of the cardiorespiratory system. And the cardiorespiratory system is a physiological system that's comprised of the heart, which is a pump, it's a two-sided pump, the right side of the heart pumps blood into the pulmonary circuit. So this is pumping blood into the into the lungs to be oxygenated by our air supply. The left side of this two-sided pump pumps blood to the systemic circuit. And this is going to be the rest of the organ systems and tissues within the body. So left side of the heart sends blood into the systemic, uh, into the systemic circulation. Uh, the heart also uh, has vessels, and these vessels are going to carry blood based off of a force called the blood pressure. And before we get down to uh, the blood vessels, and then also we'll talk a little bit about the lungs, since the, the pump is generating pressure, the heart is generating pressure, uh, it's going to be important to know the two different types of pressures that are experienced within the cardiorespiratory system. Those are going to be systolic pressure or systole, which is the blood pressure during active contraction of the heart. The other pressure is the pressure in the heart during relaxation, uh, which is called diastole. So the diastolic pressure is going to be this pressure in the heart when the heart is not, or I should say pressure in the cardiorespiratory system when the heart is not actively generating heartbeat, you're actively generating pressure. All right, so alongside the heart, which is our pressure-inducing organ within the cardiorespiratory system, we also have blood vessels. And these are simply going to be tubes that carry blood throughout the organism. There are three different types of blood vessels. The arteries, and these are vessels that carry blood away from the heart. Complementary to the arteries are the veins, and these will do the opposite. These are the vessels that will carry blood to the heart. Now it's possible that in the past, maybe a high school biology class or a previous biology class or physiology class, that you heard that arteries were the vessels that carry oxygenated blood and the veins were the uh, vessels that carry deoxygenated blood. And that's actually incorrect because we're going to have examples of arteries leading to uh, away from the heart to the pulmonary circuit that are actually carrying blood that has low levels of oxygen, and then veins coming back from the pulmonary circuit carrying oxygenated blood. So that convention doesn't really hold. The best definitions for arteries and veins are those that I've written here. The third type of vessel are the capillaries. And really, the arteries carry blood to capillaries, the veins carry the blood away from the capillaries, and the capillaries are very small blood vessels. And these very small blood vessels carry blood into the tissue, so the, the, the vessels that distribute blood to all different parts of the organism or the body. Okay, so these uh, three different points here, the heart, the blood pressure, the blood vessels, all detail the anatomy and basic physiology of the cardio side of the cardiorespiratory system. 
the respiratory side comes from our lungs. Now the lungs themselves, uh, they are comprised of these tiny little sacs called alveoli. The alveoli are these tiny air sacs. Every time you breathe, these tiny air sacs fill up with the air from the environment containing a variety of different gases of particular importance for humans is going to be oxygen and carbon dioxide, really of all the living organisms. And so the air that we breathe in, fill up these tiny air sacs, contains oxygen. And these gases of oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse in with your oxygen and go out with your carbon dioxide in and out of the bloodstream. And then it's going to be the responsibility of the blood to carry the oxygen to the working tissues. Now, if we can do this optimally, we will have a higher level of cardiorespiratory fitness. So let's take a look at the system at rest versus during the stress of exercise, so during exercise. So here's just a, a brief rundown in the figure here that shows some of the major differences between the um, cardiorespiratory system at rest and, and during exercise. You can see a vast difference in heart rate. Uh, the breathing rate significantly changes. The amount of oxygen that you're bringing in significantly changes as we shift over towards exercise. Notice, too, the blood pressure. Uh, dystolic actually stays right about the same, but the systolic actually increases quite a bit. And then cardiac output, which is this measure of how much blood is circulated in a unit of time, typically a minute. This would be a minute, uh, five quarts of, uh, of blood in a minute at rest and 20 quarts of blood during exercise. And then also notice that the distribution here of where blood is being pumped to at rest, 15 to 20 percent, goes to the muscles. Now the muscle becomes very much your working tissue during exercise and we increase that up to 85 to 90 percent when we shift over towards exercise. So the individual who can shift these variables during exercise to a higher magnitude is going to have a higher level of cardiorespiratory fitness. And there, is, there are ways in which we can train for cardiorespiratory fitness and we can improve the overall health benefits that can be garnered from uh, exercise and, and in response to um, cardiorespiratory endurance. So before we go there, I'd like to pick up with just a brief discussion on how we actually go through the process of fueling cardiorespiratory training. In other words, how do we produce energy to fuel these massive changes that we see from rest to exercise? Now, overall, this idea can be summarized in the science of metabolism. And metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions so all the chemical reactions or the chemical processes that are necessary to maintain the body. And as you probably can imagine, as you go from rest to exercise, the metabolic demand, the sum of all the chemical processes necessary to maintain the body during the stress of exercise is going to be greater than what we observe during rest. So where do we get the necessary requirements for all of these chemical processes? And this short answer is that it comes from our diet. Our energy to fuel metabolism is from the food that you consume with your diet. And one of the major components of your diet, or what should be a major component of your diet, is a molecule called glucose. So we can break down glucose to generate, uh, generate energy. Now this glucose is broken down from food. 
So we take our food and we break it down into glucose, among some other macronutrients, and I'm sure you're aware of those. We call them fats and proteins. In particular, glucose, however, is going to be a molecule that we readily use to supply the required energy for the chemical processes of metabolism. Not only do we use glucose, but we also store it. And glucose can be stored as a molecule called glycogen. Glycogen is a long branch chain molecule, and it's actually very, very similar to another storage molecule, another storage sugar called starch. So this is actually analogous to the starch that you find in plants, only this is specific to animals, including humans. Now this glucose, when it's broken down from its native glucose state, we are basically rearranging electrons and rearranging chemical bonds, and eventually we begin to generate a molecule called ATP. That's adenosine triphosphate. And you have maybe heard ATP referred to as the energy currency of the cell. And the reason that we call it the energy currency of the cell is because this is the energy or the type of molecule that we can use to buy the required metabolic needs of all of these chemical processes. So we're using it as a currency, and it does have to be exchanged from glucose. We cannot directly use glucose as an energy supply. We have to convert glucose into ATP, and then it's the ATP that becomes uh, directly usable by, uh, by animals and, and other organisms, uh, including humans. So what you're looking at here are, are three different types of energy systems. So when you begin to exercise, you use all three of these systems in different, uh, different amounts. And really, the net result is the production of ATP. So immediate, uh, 0 to 10 seconds, you have a, a, an immediate supply of ATP that's just in storage and ready to be used. Then we have a non-oxidative form of uh, energy production. And this is from 10 to 2 minutes, and we typically uh, produce this through the, through the fermentation of a molecule called pyruvate into another molecule called lactic acid. And I'm sure you've all experienced lactic acid before. It's what accounts for the burning when you uh, are running really fast or when you're sprinting. Can't keep up a sprint forever. You might be able to last 2 to 5 minutes. At that point, you're going to shift over to an oxidative level of uh, and ATP production. Notice that this does require oxygen. The other two didn't require oxygen. So you have to slow down so that the energy demand can be can be met with the oxygen supply. So you slow down just a little bit, reduces muscle contraction. That reduces the demand that the energy, uh, I'm sorry, that the muscles are placing on the energy system. And we begin to produce ATP through this particular system. Now, this looks like they're all very much independent of each other. And in reality, they actually occur all simultaneously. You'll notice that at the very beginning of exercise, you actually have small amounts of both oxidative and non-oxidative energy supply, even though your majority is coming from that immediate. So this is only about only about 99%, remaining 1% comes from here. And then we sort of go through the shift where uh, the, the immediate comes down to very close to zero, not quite zero, but very close to zero. Oxidative takes over, and then the non-oxidative slowly decreases. Okay, so that's uh, basically, in a nutshell, some of the anatomy and physiology of the cardiorespiratory system and how we actually supply energy. The better we can supply energy, the better fitness the cardiorespiratory system is going to have. Now, what are some of the benefits beyond just being able to supply energy well, what are some of the benefits to training the cardiorespiratory system using cardiorespiratory type endurance? So some of the benefits. As we've already alluded to, it's supposed to be improved. Go ahead and change that. We can have improved cardiorespiratory function better oxygen carrying, better energy supply. But we're also going to have improvements 
cellular metabolism. That's some of all of those chemical reactions occurring to keep the organism alive. We're going to have more efficient use of cell metabolism. A big one is a great reduction in the risk for a variety of different what are called chronic diseases. This figure here you can see if you have a low cardiorespiratory fitness level versus a high, you have a much, much higher relative risk of death. And as you increase your cardiorespiratory endurance, we have this nice downward trend. So what are some of these chronic diseases that you'd be able to reduce with cardiorespiratory type fitness training? One is cardiovascular disease. Another, certain types of cancer, type 2 type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, and just in general reduction in death as this figure shows from all different causes. So in addition to reducing these diseases, you're also going to see better control of body fat. You'll also see improved immune function. Every time you participate in cardiorespiratory type training, you are actually improving your immune function providing your body a lower, a lower uh, rate or a lower prevalence or probability of becoming sick. We also have seen improved psychological and emotional well-being. So overall, cardiorespiratory uh, fitness training is, is very, very important. It helps to really improve many different aspects of human health. So how do we go about assessing your current state of cardiorespiratory fitness? Now, there are multiple different ways to approach this question. Uh, there's a variety of different types of field tests, and really what we're doing with cardiorespiratory fitness assessment is we're, we're looking to see how well oxygen is supplied to the working tissue. So there are field tests for a variable called maximal oxygen consumption. or a so-called E2, I'm sorry, a so-called VO2 max. So this is a variable that shows the maximum amount of oxygen that can be extracted from the air that you breathe in, circulated in the bloodstream, and then deposited into the working tissue. Now, the higher your VO2 max is, or the higher your maximal oxygen consumption is, the higher level of cardiorespiratory fitness that you have, the closer that you are to this end of this particular figure. So a couple things that you can do. You can participate in the one-mile walk test. And then you can use an equation based off of your time, your gender, and other variables to calculate or to estimate your maximal oxygen consumption. Another way is to participate in the three-minute step test. A third alternative 
is the 1.5 mile run walk test. Now each of these three different assessment tools are very, very easy to use, doesn't take a lot of expensive or complicated equipment. You go out with a stopwatch and you collect some of the data on yourself and you can get a measurement of your oxygen uptake and then you can compare that maximal oxygen uptake to known uh, oxygen uptakes as they relate to your level of fitness and you can place yourself somewhere along here from a low level of fitness to a high level of fitness and begin to understand what your relative risk is for a variety of different conditions. And so maybe you've just done this recently and you're on this side and you're at a very high relative list risk for uh, death or other types of diseases because of your low fitness level. So from here one of the next steps is to try to improve along this curve towards a higher fitness and a lower relative risk. And fortunately, with some very straightforward techniques, we can simply develop a cardiorespiratory endurance program. And this developed program, not only is it going to have some immediate benefits such as reductions in heart rate, uh, uh, resting heart rate, reductions in blood pressure, reductions in uh, cholesterol levels immediately. It also will have very long-term benefits as well. So how do we go through and tap into the benefits of cardiorespiratory endurance? As with all different types of exercise programs, the planning process always begins with setting goals. So what are some realistic goal goals that you could set for yourself? Maybe you want to have a VO2 max that is going to place you in this higher fitness category with the relatively uh, lower risk. So set some goals, some general goals and some specific goals. And as we talked about uh, previously, the next step is going to be to apply the fit principle. And you'll remember that the FIT principle is an acronym and it's frequency, intensity, time, and type. And so we're going to have a frequency. How frequently are we going to participate in cardiorespiratory type training? We're going to have an intensity. How hard or how fast are we going to exert ourselves? How long, a duration, or a time? And then lastly, the type of activity. Are you going to utilize things like cycling or running or walking? So with that, let's take a look at each of these and, and get an idea of the guidelines that are recommended so that you can begin to immediately benefit and begin to swing down towards a higher fitness level or if you're already at this high fitness level, continue to maintain that higher level of health. So from the frequency perspective, the recommendations are to train between three and five days per week. So you should be participating in cardiorespiratory endurance type training three to five days per week. Now if you're a beginner, and a beginner is going to be anyone who has not regularly participated in physical activity, and in particular cardiorespiratory endurance type training, for uh, a prolonged period of time. So beginners should start with frequencies about three days per week and then work up or progress from there up to about five days per week. So three to five days per week and if you're a beginner start off the low side and progress up to the higher side. Now how about intensity? One of the best ways to evaluate your intensity of cardiorespiratory endurance training is to set target heart rate zones. So the target heart rate zone, and you are going to want to calculate this 
by estimating first and foremost your max heart rate. Now there are some ways that you can directly measure your max heart rate. These typically require a little bit higher level of knowledge, a little bit higher uh, level of equipment, exp more expensive equipment, treadmills, heart rate monitors, or uh, ECG units. Uh, but fortunately there's an actually a very convenient way to estimate your max heart rate. And there's just simply an equation of 220 minus your current age. This will give you your max heart rate, your MRH. Uh, an example for a 20 year old, it's just simply 220 minus your age of 20, so max heart rate would be right around 200. Now, once you've calculated your max heart rate, you're going to use that to multiply, or to calculate, I should say. Uh, a training zone, right? We're trying to get at this idea of a heart rate zone or a target heart rate zone. So you're going to multiply your max heart rate by two two different numbers. A lower number, which is the lower portion of the zone, which is 65%, and then a higher number, which is the higher portion of the zone, and that's going to be 90%. So 65 to 90%, and this is your Target heart rate zone. Uh, just one word of caution here for those beginners or people who are unfit. It's recommended that you should reduce the lower portion of the target heart rate zone. Start at 55% rather than 65% of the max heart rate. Okay, I'm going to go through an example here real quick. So uh, we're going to consider an individual who is 19 years old. So individual who's 19 years old. First, calculate your max heart rate. So max heart rate is 220 minus your age, which is 19. And that gives this individual an estimated maximum heart rate of 201. Now I go through and I'm going to multiply for my lower end of my training zone and the upper end of my training zone. So 65% is going to be the lower end. 65% intensity can be calculated by converting 65% into decimal format, 0.65. Multiply that times by 201, and that gives me roughly 131 beats per minute. We do the same for the higher intensity, 90% intensity, converted again into a decimal format that gives us 0 0.9 times our max heart rate of 201, and so this gives us 181 beats per minute. So this individual's training zone is 131 to 181 beats per minute. And if they're anywhere within this zone, so 150, 160, 140, they're within the tr target training, heart rate training zone for car maximal cardiorespiratory endurance training. Now, you obviously could use something like a heart rate monitor to keep track of uh, your heart rate during training. Not everybody can afford, not anyone, everyone really needs to have a heart rate monitor. And fortunately, there are some other monitoring strategies that we can use for intensity. Okay, so the monitor intensity, there are two different places that we can actually palpate or feel our heart rate. So we can take a look at our heart rate either by measuring this artery in the neck, which is the carotid artery, or the heart rate here, the pulse here in the forearm on the wrist, which is the radial artery.
Now, the best way to approach this is to simply palpate or to feel the, the pulse at either of those locations and count the number of beats for 10 seconds. Then, just simply take and multiply that number of beats in 10 seconds by 6, and that will give you the total number of beats in a minute. Now, one word of warning, if you choose to use the carotid artery as your intensity measure, this is very close to the brain, and you can put too much pressure on that artery, and you can occlude blood flow to the brain, which will cause you to pass out. Not a very good thing to do, so you're going to want to avoid making that error. If you're not comfortable with heart rate, there's actually one additional way to measure intensity without expensive pieces of equipment. And that's a scale that's called a ratings of perceived exertion. Okay, the ratings of perceived exertion are just simply RPE for short. Now this is a Likert style a Likert style scale, and it starts at six and goes up to twenty. And as you can see, as you progress from six to twenty, you go from what feels to be or you're perceiving to be light workload, a very light workload, extremely light workload, light, all the way up until you're at maximal exertion. And so you would estimate your workload with one of these numbers and get an idea of where you are working. And for optimal cardiorespiratory endurance training, you're going to be right here towards the middle, similar to what it would look like with our heart rate, only this time you're using your perception rather than the quantitative measure of heart rate. Okay, so that's intensity. How about duration? Duration for cardiorespiratory endurance type exercise is recommended to be between 20 and 60 minutes per session. So you may have three to five sessions per week, and each of those sessions is 20 to 60 minutes. Now, what's interesting about this is you can use a single session. And so maybe you utilize one 60-minute se se session three days a week, and you're going to gain a, a benefit of cardiorespiratory endurance. But it doesn't always have to be just one single session. You actually can use multiple sessions of a minimum of 10, 10 minutes per session. So 10 minutes or more. And what we find is if you accumulate your 20 to 60 minutes using these shorter 10, 15, 20 minute sessions, you actually gain the same benefits or similar benefits as if it's just one prolonged session. Now, the, the range of 20 to 60, the differences there are going to be dictated by the different intensity levels. So if it's a more intense workout, maybe closer to your 90%, you're going to use a lower duration. So different intensities require different durations. When you're at that 90% high intensity, you want to tend this towards 20 minutes. If you are in that low to moderate intensity, region, it'll be 45 to 60 minutes for that. Now, one last thing to uh, mention here before we close this lecture down. When you go through and make a uh, or com complete a session, a cardiorespiratory endurance session, you're going to undergo uh, a progression. 
from the point where you start to the point where you stop. And you can see that you are going to take time, as sh is shown here on this curve, until you get into your, your heart, target heart rate zone. This is where you would begin and end your 20 to 60 minute time period. Notice that for this individual, they get up there within um, first couple of, uh, of minutes, five to 10 minutes, and then about five to 10 minutes uh, to cool down. This is not included in that 20 to 60 minutes. So it might be five minutes to get there, 20 minutes to complete, and then five minutes to finish up for a total time of 30 minutes with 20 minutes of cardiorespiratory type endurance training. All right, that's all I have for this lecture on cardiorespiratory endurance training.